Dr. Lawrence O'Rourke, thank you very much uh, for joining the podcast this morning. Great to see you. Thanks very much, Brendan. Great to be here. No, I'm, I'm really excited uh, about this one. As we, we spoke uh, a little bit uh, before we were, were doing the podcast, I'm, I'm a keen amateur enthusiast for all things space, especially as I get older and older. So I've been looking forward to this one all week. And uh, I mean, you're, you're working on, on the Plato uh, satellite project at the European Space Agency. So what I thought we might start off is, is talk a little bit maybe about the European Space Agency itself and maybe a little bit about your current role in it then as well. Sure, sure. So, it, I mean, everybody has heard of NASA. You know, it's it's so so it's such a major name in, in all households, and maybe less have uh, heard of ESA. And yet, ESA is the European Space Agency. It's uh, if it, it, Portugal, all the European countries. Of course, Ireland. There's no doubt is is uh, one of the key members of the European Space Agency. And there's 22 members. And uh, the benefits of having all these countries joined together with with one mission in mind, which is, uh, you know, to, to uh, study, explore space in, a, in peaceful ways, well, it, it allows you to, to merge the money together and come up with really, really uh, cool projects and scientific projects, but also technology projects and even even just the, the weather weather satellites, which give us the weather that the news all comes from uh, originating from the European Space Agency. So 22 members, Ireland is one of the key members, and uh, because Ireland is a member, then uh, then I, as being being Irish, there well would be a staff member. I'm allowed to be a staff member of the European Space Agency, and I've been with the European Space Agency about 20 years. Uh, and currently, I'm working in in one of its uh, six sites, in fact, because it has different sites around Europe. Let's say the headquarters is in France, in Paris. Um, it builds the satellites. The technology center is in Aztec. It's in Holland. Uh, it's close to Amsterdam. The, um, the when the satellite is placed on top of the rocket. Uh, it uh, and it's put into space. Then, when it separates from the rocket, you have uh, the operation center, which is based in in Germany, close to Frankfurt, uh, Darmstadt, and that's the European Space Operation Center. So it's the ESOC, it's called. The one in in in, in Holland is called ESTEC. The one in in in, in um, Germany is called ESOC. And now, and, and I worked. So I've worked in both those places. And now I'm working at the present moment uh, in the European Space Astronomy Center, which is in fact the science center for for ESA. Uh, he's a science missions and it's based near madrid and uh, currently i'm working on a mission called plato and plato is a satellite which launches it still feels a long time away it's about four years away it's in, in fact it's the end of 2026 even nearly five and um it's it's a mission which will uh which will study the stars but i mean it's a very strange mission because it's a huge it's got 26 cameras all pointing towards a huge location a big area of the sky and we're going to be studying uh, studying all the stars in that region, but we're looking at stars like our sun, and you're looking at uh, at uh, how the light from these stars actually dim when a satellite, when a planet passes in front. And so it's what's called an exoplanetary mission, and it's one of the the I think it's going to be one of the coolest missions coming out in in, in many years from ESA. So uh, I might talk about that later. Yeah, we we will definitely come back, come back to that. Uh, it's it's a fascinating project, and maybe let's take it right back and how you arrived at at the European Space Agency, and, and go all the way back to maybe your your ed early education, Lawrence, and and how it all how it all started. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's uh, it 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 doesn't feel so long away, but of course it's quite a while. I mean, it's it's clear when you're in. Uh, primary school and uh, and you've always got interest in space but that's just normal and you go to secondary school and and you start studying and you're trying to think well what do I what do I want to do after secondary school what do I want to do in university and and to be fully honest I didn't know myself I didn't have a clue uh, so what you do is you pick for leave and search you pick you keep your options open and I had uh, finance we had accountancy and I had um, I had biology uh, and um, and even tech draw. So and although I have to admit I was terrible at drawing, <laughs> that's why I didn't. I did only okay in that. But I mean, you keep the options open because you don't know what you're going to do. And uh, and in some ways, um, I was just lucky that uh, that the points I got from the even sort were sufficient to to put me to do a science degree. It's it could easily have put me to do a, a commerce degree or uh, or you know an engineering degree. It's just that. Uh, maybe my fate was destined to go towards science, and and so I went to a uh, university in Manute, and I did uh, started doing science degree. And it was when I was there already in the in the first year that I recognised that that um, it was it was something that I was more interested in. In fact, I I started studying physics and chemistry, and I hadn't studied those in in school, and um, and yet if you think with with all these years in university, I came out of Manute with a double honours degree in physics and maths. So I hadn't done physics in the Leaving Cert, 
and I came out with a double honours, an honours degree in it, which is um, which just goes to show that often the things you're good at, maybe it's just in in school, um, you don't realise until afterwards that uh, that this was the made, this was meant to be. But uh, that's life, you know. It, uh, I think it's it's uh, it's what's uh, uh, you, your 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 choices. Um, you can even make them after you leave uh, with the leave insert. So I did. How, did got Lawrence, can I ask? Had. Can I ask how how tough was it not having done physics in the leaving? To go into university and and do it was that was that very tough or did you have a natural like uh, ability in it anyway? I think you know it, it is tough because of course it's the first time you see material like that even even chemistry as well, and it um, it certainly is is in 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 secondary school you really helped to learn I mean you you got the teachers there which tried to force things down your head down your throat which is normal that's what they're that's what they do. But in university, you're very much independent, and, uh, and and you have to learn this all by yourself. And there's a huge amount of material. And I guess over time, I just found that I found it easier to learn physics than I did to learn chemistry or even biology. I just found that it, it was a lot more mathematically orientated, and my my mind was a lot more mathematics based. Um, and and I think this was one of the reasons why I, in the end I started focusing. I found it a lot easier to to uh, get my round my my mind around it, which uh, was was really nice. That was good. Yeah, yeah. And so you got the double honors in maths and physics, and and what what happened next? So I went to I was uh, I did a masters in microelectronics in in Cork. So I went to UCC and I did a masters down there, um, uh, which was really really good because Cork is a, is a lovely city, and I spent uh, two years there. And then um, then I was given uh, then I was I was kept on to do work. So I was working effectively. So I was doing the masters and the and I started working in the, it's now called the Tyndale Institute. It was originally called the National Microelectronics Research Center, NMRC. Now it's called Tyndale. And I was there for um, a number of years after the master's. Um, but what, what the master's taught me was the microelectronics, which is uh, all the silicon chips and how you build, put them together into little, well, whether it's the circuit boards you're building or, or even the little, uh, the, uh, uh, little devices that you put in your in your phones or on on the circuit board, so it teaches you how to build all of these and uh, how it's constructed. And this, um, and an opportunity arose uh, to, or at least a friend of mine applied from when he was working with me. Uh, he applied to the European Space Agency Young Graduate Program, um, and he was uh, he was uh, offered a place. And he was telling me all about uh, ESA, and, uh, and of course I was very interested. So he was there for a year, and he was telling me all about it during the year. And so I applied myself. And the fact that I had the masters, because really you need a masters to be a young graduate, I had a masters in in, in an area which was a very um, which was considered very important for ESA, which is microelectronics. Because of course microelectronics uh, is not just a case of you have it in your computers and your phones, but of course it's it's what controls the the, the satellites when you launch them. It's what controls uh, the 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 modules that you might want to land for the moon or the, anything that you want to put into space is all based on 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 uh, the silicon chips and the microelectronics and so i had that experience i went to, to i was invited as a young graduate and i and i went there uh for, for for one year i was in holland for one year originally for one year and i stayed for two uh, and and uh, then a catastrophe happened strange a catastrophe what i i guess it's one person's uh, downfall is another person's, let's say, you know, benefits. It's just the way it mm. is. And and uh, the the Ariane five rocket, which is one of the key rockets for European Space Agency, uh, it's it was the first launch, and it had two four satellites on top called Cluster, which were for studying the magnetosphere, and it blew up. And um, because it blew up, uh, it was the first launch. Uh, then there was a very, and you can understand why, there was a strong reticence not that companies didn't want to put their satellite on the second one until they were sure it works, you know, I mean, it's, uh, yeah. you know, it's just the way it is. So there was a, an opportunity rose because I was a young graduate for the young graduates to build a satellite and put it on the next rocket. Oh, sorry, I'm just going to stop this. No, no worries. Um, so, um, uh, so an opportunity rose to, to put a, for the young graduates to build a satellite and put it on the next rocket. And so I took advantage of that and I, um, and I and that's where I got really involved in in building satellites and understanding what what they were all about because up to that point I was studying micro I was had microelectronics I was helping f test things in the lab but to actually get my hands on on real hardware and to be actually build something which in the end the flew in space was really a, 
extraordinary. So sometimes this, this is what happens in life. You, things come along and you've got to grab them with both hands because opportunities are very, uh, they don't come often, but when you when you get them, you, you've got to grasp them with both you hands. And this is what them. I did. Now, what, take... kind, what kind of a size team, Lawrence, works on, on a job like that when you're you're developing a satellite from scratch to put on a rocket? Well, I mean, it's, it's a very, this was a small team because... Uh, the satellite wasn't very big. It was about 100 kilos, which is um, well. It depends on the, you look. At, you've got nano satellites now, which are just uh, one kilo or even less. But this yeah. one was still quite big for for let's say for for that time. The team was uh, the was the young graduates, which we which we were it was quite a group of us, about 30 people or so, 30 of us. And then you had uh, the experts, because of course it weren't it wasn't just a case of here go figure it out yourselves and and uh, and let us know how you get on. But no, it was really a an ESA all the ESA experts got around us and actually we contributed towards uh, towards building the satellite. So there you had people in the mechanical lab in Aztec who were helping building the components. Uh, you had people who had uh, expertise in electrical engineering who were teaching some of the young graduates how to do the circuit or the, how to do all the harnesses, which is how the electronic, the, the cabling connecting. You had people who were experts in the thermal aspects. I mean, because of course to survive in space, you need to deal with the, the thermal and the heat and the cold. Um, yeah. And all of this, you had a lot of experts around. So the, in the end, you end up with hundreds who were involved. It's just it's just the reality of it all. It's a, it, there was a core team of young graduates and a lot of experts helping us. And so mm -hmm. we we uh, we built the satellite. We were uh, very lucky to go to Kourou, uh, which is where the satellite is 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 built. Uh, sorry, was launched from. And uh, and I went there because I was helping to to uh, with the integration of one of the satellites. So you're getting a hands on. And uh, from there, they they launched the satellite. Peru, sorry. Where's that? It's in French Where Guyana. Where is Peru? So Peru oh. is in French Guyana. It's it's about five degrees below the equator. So it's uh, it's like uh, yeah, it's it's on the it's right between. It's very close to Brazil, very close to Brazil. It's just north of Brazil, yeah. uh, and it's uh, it's um, it's French speaking. It's uh, yeah. so it's a colony of France effectively, and it's where the European Space Agency builds all its rockets. Uh, and we launched oh. them. So all European satellites, all satellites from ESA would launch from there. Um, right. It's, it's quite an amazing place. It's a tropical place. It's a very uh, unusual place because when you go there, you have uh, you really are, uh, uh, especially in, in those times when I went, you're separated from the world. I mean, there's there's very little internet at the time and, and even the strangest things about, uh, it's, it's not really for this podcast, but things like, you know, butterflies that have dust on their wings, which when they land, when the dust lands on your arm, it actually enters the skin. And when you try to scratch it, it actually makes you bleed. Or, the, or, you, or you're oh, walking amazing. on the sand and you have things in the sand which actually can burrow into your feet. It's just, it's a, it's <laughs> wow. a crazy, it's a crazy <laughs> thing. But in this, in this tropical world, you have a launch site and uh, you got these rockets which are which are huge and 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 so when i when i traveled to Kourou to get that opportunity to travel there and you're going to this humid place where it is and you get to visit uh, and see a satellite see a rocket up close it's just uh, extraordinary you, you've got a, a nine store well you got a, an elevator which takes a nine story ride up just and you're looking up the side of a rocket it's just it's mind-blowing mind-blowing amazing what an experience for a young graduate as well absolutely amazing. Absolutely, yeah. it was really, really useful, really, really amazing, and uh, and I benefited a lot. And so you have to grab these opportunities with two hands, but also enjoy them because it's not yeah. uh, it's not often that happen. Yeah. Often yeah. Happen. And was that that launch presumably was successful? Then was it? So what happened? Um, so when we built the satellite, uh, we went to Kourou, went to French Guiana, and then we uh, left it there. And then then we 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 went back uh, home let's say back to Holland, and then it launched. And the launch itself was successful. There was still a small problem with the, with the, with the rocket, but um, in that it left the satellite lower than it should have been, but which, which means it was a good idea not to put a, a satellite on the second rocket, at least until you've ironed out all the things, because it would have been lower in orbit. But because of what we had done, the satellite worked. It was just three days because it didn't have any solar panels. So there was no way to keep it alive. It had a big battery, like your phone. When the battery runs out, that's it. And so it lasted yeah. three days. And um, we got a lot of science. So we got pictures uh, pictures of the Earth. And we were checking communication with, the, with uh, communication satellites, looking for atomic oxygen. Did a lot of things with a lot of scientific experiments on the satellite. And, and because of that, because we were... Uh, when one thing is to build a satellite, and another one is to operate it in space. And so the the experience gained in operating the satellite 
uh, in space was what gave me effectively gave me the, the experience needed to get the job in Holland sorry in Germany so I went to that's where I got a job to work in the European Space Operations Center and so I was there uh, to to work on a satellite called Envisat, which was the biggest environmental satellite ever launched, really huge, and uh, it's still in space now. And I was and I was in Ezoc for in Germany for six years, six and a half years, and there I worked on Envisat, and there I, after Envisat I started I worked on Rosetta. And Rosetta is a satellite which was launched in 2004, uh, rendezvoused with it with a comet and uh, put a lander on the surface, and effectively watched the comet uh, wake up. Uh, when it was getting far, getting close to the sun, and then go to sleep when it started moving away, and and so I was on the on the control team, on the flight control team, it's called, which is uh, the team which operates the satellite after it separates from the rocket. And I was the 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 first one to move the antenna in space. It has a huge antenna for communicating with the Earth, and so you you sending commands to to move the antenna and to change the direction, point this direction, and you're checking the communications working. And that was all. What did that feel like? Mechanism. That's that very first, um, that first move. It's a very exciting experience. It's very exciting. You, the, the, the thing is, uh, when, you, when you look at, uh, I, I, I don't know, because I cannot have the experience with, with other jobs, but I think in the space area, there's so many experiences that, that you have. I mean, whether it's just a simple experience of working on a satellite and watching that satellite on top of a rocket. And, and of course, what a rocket is, is a controlled explosion. It's really, it's just a, it's a lot of explosives. You light it, but it goes upwards. You know, it doesn't just go outwards. It goes upwards. And on top of that, explosion is a satellite. And so you're watching this, your satellite, your little baby, if you want to call it that, on top of this thing, uh, flying into space. And of course, it's not just a case of being on a rocket. It has to separate it. When it's separated, then you start getting, you get, you communicate with the satellite. And this is just extraordinary. And so uh, you get that experience. But then when you're, when you start communicating and you can actually send a command and it does what you tell it to do which is <laughs> what it's supposed to do but even the simple thing of moving a mechanism like the you know the antenna which is stuck in the side and starts moving down as you've actually as you fire the pyros which is little explosives it separates cart moving down you change direction you can communicate with it all this is very it's it's very rewarding and it's a very exciting thing to do very exciting yeah yeah. And can you talk a little bit more about uh, Rosetta, Lawrence? Because it, 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 I've, I've listened to you on, online talking about it uh, during the week as well. So this was a comet that came in from the orbit of Jupiter, wasn't it, or something like That's that? That's right. Yeah, it's Jupiter yeah. family comet. Yeah. So yeah. I, comets, there's a huge amount of comets in the, in the solar system. I mean, you just do not realize that people have heard of asteroids or even meteorites, which are bits of asteroids. But, uh, uh, and, and the asteroids are between Mars and Jupiter. You have the asteroid belt and then when you get further out then everything gets colder of course and then the colder you get well then you start having a lot more uh, uh, let's say water ice and other ice is being just frozen and as you have these frozen bodies which are just ice uh, uh, mixed with dust in fact because there's a lot of dust in the in in, in the sky um, a huge amount of dust in space uh, and maybe I'll, I'll tell you a bit about that later when we discuss Herschel but um, yeah. but uh, it, it, this dust has made when in the formation of the of the stars i mean you have these huge dust clouds which which collapse and produce the stars but the dust because it's hanging around also you have it mixing with the gases which are which freeze these uh, this mix of gas and dust produces a comet and if you go beyond neptune out uh, you you start hitting the uh, the what's called the cooper edgeworth belt now people call it the cooper belt but in fact it's called the cooper edgeworth belt and it's it's a bit of a pity because edgeworth the second name there was two people who discovered it and um edgeworth in fact was from county westmead and it's mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, yeah it's it's really it's really amazing to, to, to know that but but this famous comet cometary sort of belt outside of uh, uh, the area of Neptune etc is uh, was is, is known as Cooper Belt in fact it's known as Cooper Edgeworth Belt uh, named after yeah. one guy from Westmead like myself I'm from Westmead and then beyond that you have uh, just going like one third of the distance to the nearest star uh, Proxima Centura is another uh, group of uh, another huge cloud of uh, comets called the Oort cloud and so you've got mm. to imagine that why we have our few planets that are around the solar system or that are in our solar system floating around the around the sun and then you've got you know millions of asteroids between mars and, and and jupiter and then you've got to think about billions of comets so our solar solar system is surrounded by a huge body of of floating ice balls and so one of these in the past would have been knocked out and sent towards uh towards our solar into this into the inner solar system in other words towards our sun and would have been captured by the orbit of Jupiter. And this one, 
And in this case, they, when they're captured by the orbit Jupiter, it means that they end up going close to the sun and then come back out and then stay, let's say, more or less close to the Jupiter orbit. It goes far out of Jupiter and come back in again. It's called a Jupiter yeah. family comet, okay, from the family Jupiter. Yeah. And the comet we were visiting uh, from Rosetta was a Jupiter family comet. In other words, it's predictable. We know where it'll be at any moment in time. We know it's going to go as far as Jupiter. When it's coming in, then it starts heating up. And we, we knew more or less what it was going to do. So we, the satellite Rosetta was built uh, with um, effectively as, as a, a floating laboratory, an laboratory to study a comet. A comet, uh, let's say, in situ. You're pretty much sitting there and you want to also put a lander on the surface so you can actually touch the surface. And so the the satellite was 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 built. I was involved in 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 the operations of the satellite after uh, in building up for launch. Separate when we when we uh, went to um, or uh, when it's after it was launched, then I was also involved in moving this antenna, as I said, and doing commissioning or just testing different things. And after that, uh, I left very soon, about six months after we launched, because I moved to Spain. And then I worked on the Herschel Space Observatory, which was looking at things in infrared. And then I went back to Rosetta. So I moved back to Rosetta. So because it had a, it takes a long time to get to a comet. It takes about 10 yeah. years. So it launched 2004 and I returned to the mission about 2011 after, you know, it's, it's, it's about seven years. And, uh, and there I became uh, the science operations coordinator. So we were building a team to, to operate the, the, um, the uh, spacecraft when it arrives around this comet uh, it starts orbiting but also you got a point you got a lot of instruments i said it's a, a floating laboratory well yeah you've got a like any laboratory you got to use all the instruments and so and and sometimes because it's a it's this floating box in space um you can't just all just generate all the data you want and it'll all come back because first of all you have a limit with how much you can communicate because it's it's only got a certain bandwidth it's like when you are using uh um, even, even with your with your uh, your internet line into the house, if you want to, if it's not so good, I mean, you're, you're going to find lots of drops in the data, and this is what happens in space. You want to uh, take it, but you you know how much you're going to get. You can't generate any more, so you've got to organize things in a certain way with all these instruments, which were you know basically 16 different instruments. Come up with a planning where they all can work, um, generate the data, and you get it down. And this is what we were doing in, in Spain. So it's it was uh, quite a, quite extraordinary. And then I had one extra thing, which I thought was very cool, uh, which I enjoyed a lot, uh, which was the the lander. I was responsible. I was is the ESA uh, system engineer for the lander. So I had a good knowledge of how the lander worked. And so the um, what is the so, lander? Okay, can so, you talk a little bit about what a lander is, Lawrence, yeah, as well? Yeah. 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 So, so the lander is, uh, is uh, it was just, uh, uh, it's like a washing machine sized box, okay, with legs, except it was, uh, it, it, it had its own, uh, it, had, it had 10 instruments inside. So it was re some really, really cool instruments. So basically, of course, the feet, on the feet itself, it had microphones. So that when you touched, it went clunk, you could actually hear the sound of the touching of the surface, so like acoustics sort of thing. Of course, there's no sound in space, but you got you measuring uh, vibration, you're measuring waves, and you could actually work out just from the sound. Also, you could work out how hard the surface was. They had lots of cameras because, of course, when you land, uh, we we effectively released the lander, which was the Philae lander, what's called. Uh, it was connected to the back of Philae, sorry, back of Rosetta. Uh, so it was traveling with Rosetta for 10 years. We arrived at a comet, we studied the surface, we mapped it, we figured out, okay, where we want to land it. We land it here in this area. And so we separated in, in November 2014. And it took about nine hours to, to, to come down. Um, and it was supposed to, when it touched the surface, it was supposed to uh, fire two harpoons, which were very, you know, ice harpoons, just shooting the surface. And then it just keeps it like, uh, then it, it rolls, it rolls a little wire to actually pull it down towards the harpoons and then fix it in place. But the harpoons never fired. So because it didn't fire, then effectively bounced and it bounced across the surface. And so we were taking pictures and suddenly you're the, the picture. You take a few pictures and, and you're, you're expecting to see a nice picture of a, I don't know, a cometary area. But what you're seeing is just, just you know, is, is like a, a picture of somebody who's dizzy. You know, pretty much just see a mix of, 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 of black and white. And this was not the first picture we expected to see from 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 yeah. Philly. So we yeah. we also knew because you know there's a lot of things which tell you when 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 the lander was moving because it has solar panels and you're measuring mm -hmm. the uh, as it's going down it's rotating and so you can tell that the sun is 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 illuminating this panel as it's rotating it starts illuminating this panel and as it rotates it illuminates this panel and of course when it lands you know the land the sun illuminates this panel and that's it it's not rotating anymore but 
when it was supposed to land, suddenly we just saw it kept on going. It kept rotating. We are going, that doesn't make bloody... That doesn't make sense, you know. Either it's passed through the comet and it's gone to the other side and this thing is just a, a ball of, uh, you know, fluff candy floss or is actually... Uh, is cry- it didn't uh, harpoon itself and that was what happened. So it crossed the surface, um, uh, bounced, in fact, uh, well, it hit the edge of a crater, it bounced again and then landed underneath a cliff and... Uh, and we were following it, and as a system engineer from ESA, I was actually, of course, I was very, very uh, interested in it. But uh, you know, people ask me, well, "Were you worried?" And uh, uh, the answer is, I mean, you, there's not. Firstly, there's not much you can do in that situation. I mean, it's out of your control. Secondly, uh, where there's life, there's hope. It's it's a very strange expression, but when it comes to a satellite and it comes to a lander, if you're getting data back from the lander. It's still alive, and that means that you, you know, you still have, uh, you know, you can still communicate with it. Uh, when you stop getting data and you don't have any connection, then then it's a, a serious problem. And so we we were communicating all the way across, and even when it landed in its final location underneath the cliff, we still had communication. So we were able to to talk to it for about uh, uh, two days effectively, and we we ran all the experiments. It had some really amazing experiments. I'll tell you one just to because I know it's uh, I don't yeah. want to bore the bore the listeners, but there's one very very cool experiment which was to um, to I had a drill which was supposed to drill down and uh, touch the surface and and the let's say the cometary dust or the dust on, that's on the surface would stick to the drill or even you know, even bits of ice and the idea was that it would actually take this drill up and bring it inside the the lander itself and then when the when the when the drill is inside it's actually it, it comes up and then it's pushed down again and uh, when it comes down it, it, when it pushes down. It, there's a little like um, container, a small little container which has been moved right underneath the drill, and so basically you just shake off the dust and uh, ice, whatever, into this little container. So basically it was just a, a little little container, and then you lift up the drill again, and the container moves on a conveyor belt, and it passes underneath two instruments, uh, which are and the instruments are uh, they smell. Okay, well, pretty much that's the, they're spectrometers. In fact, what they do is they 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 measure the gases. But how do you do this? Well, you got to. It's pretty much like smelling. Okay, but how do you smell yeah. gases if this material is is if it's ice and dust? Well, what you do, you heat it up. And so what you what you do is you bring it up and underneath these things, and you actually heat underneath it. The gas, the the the, the ice changes to gas because there's no water. It's just there's no water in space. It's just it's sublimation. It's it's a great name for it. sublimes. So it's a, a sublime yeah. situation of changes directly from 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 uh, ice to, to gas and when it changes the gas then these instruments they sniff it and then they actually can measure what's in the in the gas and this was uh was another instrument that were there it it had tons of instruments and it did so many things very very cool very cool absolutely and it, but it was lost it was lost on the surface and that was one of my jobs maybe we can discuss it later about how how i helped find philly and in fact even yeah. the the touchdown point which is uh, uh the second touchdown point which was never Never found. I found it yeah. uh, two years ago, and uh, and I published a, paper, a, a nature paper on it. So I can mention that. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean that's okay. really interesting. How did you how did you find it? Well, it's it's like it's like this. I mean the um, you know imagine when we were going to the comet, you have you you, you more or less predict okay what's the comet going to look like? What's the surface going to look like? And you're thinking well it's first of all it's a lot of ice, and we know ice. You know when it snows. You know, we, we, if it's smooth enough, you know, you've got nice flat areas. And we were expecting to have lots of flat areas to land on. But the problem was, that's not what the comet looked like. It was very rugged, lots of huge boulders, uh, cometary boulders, which are pretty much, you know, structures. There's ice inside and just covered in dust. And so the whole area was just, was was full of crevices, full of hills and valleys and uh, and, uh, and and lots of cliffs, lots of cliff regions. And so when it, when it crossed the surface... We, um, we, we, the place we picked for it to land was a very boring place. Why? Because you wanted to land. You wanted to land in a safe location. Um, and but it didn't stay there. It just said, okay, I've had enough of this. I mean, this is just too boring. I'm gonna, I'm gonna head over here. You know, I, I saw more cool things over here, and across the surface. And so, it took us a long time to find it. And it took us, um, we, the mission ended at the end of September 2016, and it ended because of Rosetta ended because the, the the comet started moving away from the sun it was starting to cool down and we decided okay well the spacecraft will not will not work beyond up to the distance of jupiter it's just too far away so we decided to end it with a with a, to look, do some very amazing science for getting as close as possible get some really very really nice pictures and we did this and we crashed rosetta onto the surface so this was the end this was planned for the end of september 2016 and we really kicked off the search for for philae 
in March 2016. So we'd, we'd, you know, only six months, let's say, to go before end of mission. And we're very far away because Comet was very active. It produced a lot of dust, a lot of gas, and made it very difficult mm. to navigate around it. So, But finally, it started cooling down, let's say, and, le- and, and it was safer to get closer. And so the, the closer you can get, the better your pictures. So consider it like this. You've got your camera and you've got a, a you know, let's say you've got one megapixel camera and you want to take something, a picture of something in the distance. Well, clearly the closer, you know, if you take a picture from a distance, you just see a lot of blur. OK, hmm. but the closer you get and it doesn't matter if it's one megapixel or, or even 12 megapixels, it's not important. There's more the closer you get to something, the, the more you can resolve, the more pixels you fill. OK, and this was the same with the camera on Rosetta. So we wanted to get it as close as possible to try to take pictures because we figured from the signal we got from her from from Philly after it landed, uh, when it landed in this cliff, we figured it was in a certain location. But this is a location, uh, you know, which is which is mostly at night time. You know, it was a lot of shadow, uh, a lot of crevices and stuff. And we we didn't have any any clear picture of uh, Philly. We didn't even we kind of had an idea where it was. And so mm. it's under a cliff. So my my why was this? And I know there's a lot of introduction. But the idea, what was my involvement? Well, basically, my involvement was to lead the team to try to find it. And so what, what I had to do was to, if X marks the spot, and we had a few Xs, then you've got to come up with, uh, you've got to recognize that you're on an area which is rugged, which has got lots of boulders and lots of cliffs and stuff. And if you are looking from one direction, then the cliff blocks your route, blocks your way. Or a boulder blocks your way, you don't see it. And so the only way to really image something to get an idea of which way is the best way to look in is take a 360 degree view. So I came up with a, an approach of taking image from different from different views, let's say a 360 degree view of, uh, of that location, so that you could gradually learn what was the best location to take the images from. But then even, even if you find the best location, it's not so easy because the orbit, the way you fly around the comet was just changing. Uh, but we found, uh, we, we, we started getting closer and closer, and we started seeing, let's call it, a, a light in the darkness, something which was like glimmering. But it was never, we were never close enough to say it was Philly. And, um, and we were running out of time. And uh, we had a few very close passes at the end of August and early September 2016. And, uh, and I did my analysis, and I said, you know what, there's a huge, you know, there's a huge structure. You, you got the cliff, which was very annoying because it blocks one direction and right in front of where philly was located was it was a like a hill like structure but in fact it looked like the shape of a nose effectively it's like it goes up like this and, and uh, it well a bit difficult to explain on the radio but just consider like a uh an, an incline it was, it was gradually starting from from the bottom and then just gradually fell, led up to the top to a, a large large let's say hill like structure and this was blocking the view and i figured out that on a certain date at a certain time we i there was this feature was in the way of Philly, but but nothing is ever straight you're you're, you're not like looking at, at, a, at a something which has been man, man-made that everything is 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 a flat line no there was an area where in fact in this area you could actually look between the boulders and look in <laughs> and this is what i did i planned mm-hmm. it to look between the boulders and we got the image and we were very close and we and there we imaged Philly on the surface and it was a fantastic picture so we really got a high resolution image of Philly on the surface but anyway, with time passed by, Rosetta ended, and uh, uh, and when I was looking for Philly on the surface, I noticed close to where Philly was landed, uh, I noticed something really strange. It looked like a, a boulder which had been actually sliced in half. It was like somebody got a chainsaw and sliced the boulder in half. And I was going, that's, you know, it's it's not normal. We don't, you know, we're we're talking about something where you're seeing ice that's been exposed. You're looking at the inside of a of a, of a boulder, but but. Ice on a comet is not exposed like that. You don't have something which mm. has got flat features. Everything is rugged and everything is, is just or covered in dust. This looked like it had been newly exposed and it looked like something actually had actually, yeah, like I said, chopped it open with a sensor. It was really like a, a flat cut. And so I, I started studying it and I did a lot of a huge, many, many hours of analysis of lots of imagery from many directions, like I said. But um, I was able to work out that Philip passed through that location. And when you study images and the images of the ice very carefully, you suddenly find that you can map the the the, the top part of Philly, which was a you know a thing you know pretty much solar panels, but a very a very big area. You could actually match the surface of Philly onto the ice. So basically, the Philly lander made an imprint on the ice, and you could actually see the structure. You could actually see the face of Philly in the ice. And oh, I saw, yeah. and I, when I figured that out, then this was was uh, really the icing on the cake. It was a pun because it really this was just this was let's say the engineering discovery the engineering discovery was and this is why i like engineering and science the engineering discovery was 
we've got something which clearly has has has, has uh, pushed in the ice okay now you got to figure out okay is it ice <laughs> so how do you know it's ice yeah. what's this bright stuff you know how do you know because i mean unless you go there and you taste it or something how do you know and so yeah. you need to use other instruments and we so we used two instruments which confirmed it was water ice and then you got to figure out well hang on so if it's if philly has actually pushed in this ice well how much how soft is the ice and this was very very uh cool which was the that philly itself has a small uh, has, has a, uh, a let's say um um a boom sticking out the back and and uh consider it like this when you have if the, if the boom is parallel to the ground okay and you got this so philly is lying on the ground okay let's just for the sake of argument and you got this boom parallel to the ground that's sticking out from the top of philly if you lift if you just shake philly up and down a bit like you're shaking like one of these uh christmas sort of uh glass things with with snow inside i mean the, the snow is is moving around well when you shake philly physically uh then the the boom will move up and down because it's attached to a spring okay and so when philly compress the ice the boom moved and so from the movement of the boom we could actually work out how much energy had been used and how long it took to 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 uh to uh, for the boom to move told us how deep was the ice and how how long it took to to compress it and this told us then how soft the ice was which was was the paper which i published which was the uh, nature paper which basically confirmed that the ice on a comet is is softer than the than the foam on your cappuccino it's it's softer and the, the foam on the on the surface of the uh, of of the the seashore, it's uh, really? it's really really super soft, and uh, and and what's more, it's ice. And this is the crazy thing about it. And then we'll we, I guess we'll we discuss the other thing. But the crazy thing about this ice is, the ice is four, about four billion years old. It's crazy to think that the ice itself had not changed because we could actually confirm that the, it had not been affected by the sun because it was in the shade. And so this ice was formed at the time of the formation of the comet, which is about four billion years ago. So it's it's um, it's hard so to take that in, isn't it? Which is, it is. It's something which uh, blows the mind when you think about it. And, I, and it's just it to be able to, to be able to be so far away, and to be able to say that this ice is you know which is, we know is is ancient. It's uh, primitive, as it's called, from the time of the, of the time before, <laughs> practically be, when before our solar system, before our planet was formed, this ice was formed, and to be able to say how soft it is, sitting in your armchair, if you want to call it that, it's a, it's a very very cool thing. And so this was yeah, one of my, let's me, I'm very happy to, to have found it, but it's uh, it's quite uh, mind blowing. No, it's incredible. It's incredible. And and just you know when you when you tell that that story, Lawrence, like you're obviously simplifying it for you know dummies like me to understand uh, at some level well, far from, you're you far guys, from a dummy now but, <laughs> oh, <well. laughs> but like i mean it's it's so it must be it's such a complex thing i mean it, you're there trying to you know rendezvous with something that's coming from so far away i think it's around fifty thousand kilometers an hour it's traveling at and then you rendezvous and you have this like incredible like uh experiment box as you say then you're landing on it like it, it must be an incredible. I mean, there's so many things that can go wrong. Obviously, um, yeah. There must be huge pressure in a role like that, and it goes back to, I guess, something I wanted to ask you about, in terms of, like, what kind of qualities does somebody, if they want to get into what you do, like, what kind of qualities do you think someone must have, uh, for a career in kind of that space exploration side of things, engineering, science. I mean, it's yeah. You've 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 touch on it. I think, I mean, when you're looking at a career in, in the space field, I mean, especially ESA, ESA has many different careers uh, you can work in. Whether, whether, whether it's like uh, the the engineering aspects or getting your fingers dirty, if you want to call it that, with the microelectronics part, which is what I worked at. Whether it's about uh, mechanical engineering um, or the, the areas of thermal mechanics, which is, um, uh, or even thermal dynamics, which is all about um, the, the uh, the structures which you build and how they can how they can work in space with with the temperatures that you have. So what is it? How do you get rid of the temperature? If it's too hot, how do you? You don't have any air, so you can't put on the air conditioning in space. So how do you get rid of that? And how the communication, telecommunications is uh, how do you communicate with a satellite in space? You got the power. I mean, even just uh, just the, the 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 solar panels themselves. I mean, you know, putting your solar panels in a house or whether it's it's on on a satellite, or even you got nuclear. But the nuclear, the ESA doesn't have any uh, nuclear uh, generators. But you have uh, um, all of these different 
uh, the ways that they, 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 they well, of course, and then the, the most, let's say two other things, which is the, the navigation, which is how do you find, how do you know which way is up in space? How do you know where you are with respect to the earth? And, yeah. uh, and of course, propulsion, which is um, uh, rocket motors and, and uh, even rotating and how do you fire things? These are all different areas of engineering. And of course, the science part, which is the, all the instruments that you're building and whether you're looking at the, at the world, at, at the, the, the um, universe, whether it's the stars or, or the planets or whether you're looking at planet Earth and you're looking down and you're looking at the, the, the areas of, of uh, whether you're looking at the weather or whether you're looking at the, the surface or the waves or, or the ice. These are different areas. And then in space, sorry, in, 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 in ECU you also have the financial aspects. Of course, you know, there's always accountancy. You know, you need to have people who, who are project controllers who are there responsible for the, for the administrative aspects. You have the uh, uh, you have law, you have space law. I mean, if you want to put a, if you want to put a satellite on top of a rocket, you've got to insure it. So there's insurance aspects as well. So when people think about space, they think about the satellite and they think about maybe yeah. the, the, the most basic thing about building a satellite. But but working in ESA is not just one career. It's many different. It's a merge of many different careers, people who follow many different paths and all working together for a common goal, which is to get this thing working in space and effectively uh, and getting the science or, or the or whatever it is that you want to get out of the out of the satellite. So in that respect, mm -hmm. it's um, it's uh, there's there's uh, there's a lot of careers that you can follow in ESA and and um, in my area. Well, I'm following I follow the career of as an engineer and and, uh, and as a scientist, and this leads you to the to uh, maybe the crux of your question, which is what subjects maybe are useful. And yeah. this is uh, you, you've heard about the STEM subjects, you know, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and this, at least in my area, is key. You know, because you're you're uh, you really you need to in order to work with if you want to build satellites or you want to understand how they work. Clearly, having an engineering an understanding of engineering is very important. But mathematics, you don't you, mathematics, even if you don't study engineering or science, is very very is very important for when you talked about this. The, the, the comet moving so fast and a satellite being able to orbit about, orbit around it. It's orbital dynamics is what it's called. And this is all mm. mathematics. And it's and really it's just mathematics on on the on, on paper and, and they're working they're to work it out and it's it's quite cool. So um the STEM subjects mm. are are the way to go. And I, I, I think it's it's extraordinary what you can get when you mix all four. But uh but sometimes you don't need all four and you don't even need STEM in order to join ESA. But uh it's 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 one of the easiest paths to get into ESA is to, or, okay, to be clear, it's very difficult to get into ESA. You know, you have uh, different career paths to get into ESA. I mean, you can, of course, uh, be a, a renowned engineer or, you know, done a lot of engineering or master's or doctor or whatever uh, in science. These are different ways to get in. But you also have from the, from those who are coming out of university, uh, you have young graduates trainee program. Uh, which ESA, which Irish Irish people, Irish students can, can join and, uh, and, uh, and apply for as highly recommended. Mm -hmm. I think there's also Irish trainees as well, even separate to undergraduate trainees, there's Irish trainees. And then you have uh, positions like stagiaires, which is like uh, traineeships, which uh, give you a capability maybe to work in an area for a few months. Um, and you have uh, research fellows, which are more for the science, those who are science-based, which they want to study a certain science area, you can actually apply to East as well and be a yeah. research fellow for a year or so. So all of these different areas to join ESA and, uh, and, and okay, and but I know your question was, well, what sort of, well, you know, to do, to, for, to work in this area, surely, you know, what other uh, things you need? Uh, it's, it's clear that uh, uh, you need to be patient, <laughs> okay? <laughs> when, when you're dealing with, I need to be calm, but it's very difficult to do this. Um, and I tell you, there's a few things which are clear. One is, uh, you have to recognize what's in your control and what is not in your control. What's under your control and what's not, not under your control. When, when, when a satellite is in space and, um, uh, and, or a lander is going towards a comet uh, and it's, you've released it and it's autonomous. Basically, you can communicate with it, but it takes you uh, half an hour to send a command. There's very little you can do. At that point, mm. all the work is all about preparing. It's all about studying uh, that the commands are in the correct order, even before. So everything, every preparation. At that point, you've done your work. Let's see how it goes. You know, and you, you, there's not much you can do. There's other times where, where you, you have to react very quickly, where, uh, especially when you're operating a satellite, where some, and especially those which are close to the Earth, where you communicate quickly. Um, there, you might have a problem, and uh, and there you need to react. Uh, uh, with, in the case of minutes, maybe to be able to respond to an issue. But normally in this case, um, 
we were we trained very well uh, you got simula simulation what's called simulation campaigns and you got which which uh, where you practice being able to deal with different scenarios that occur and you always have procedures to deal with uh, to deal with it. so if something goes wrong you would need a procedure which you will execute and say oh this is what you need to send a uh, correction so it's um uh it's it yeah it's uh, yeah. a difficult question to answer i suppose in the no, end it's you great know, insights just, uh, no you <laughs> No, you've given great insights there. And, and I have another question for you. Did, did you have like an aha moment where you, you kind of thought, you know, you wanted a career in space exploration? Was there a moment in time where you thought this is for me? Or was, there, was it more of a, as you said, at the beginning, a bit more organic than that? Well, I think that's, uh, uh, I think it's a very good question because uh, you can always answer, well, I was always interested in space since I was, since I was a child or something. And of course, everybody's interested in space. It's, it's a very standard answer. I used to draw rockets, but everybody drew rockets. You know, it's, it's normal. But when yeah. did I, re I, I think it's more, the, the, the more the point is, when did I think that I actually could work in space? Because it's always, you always want to, but it's when do you think the positive, because we all believe, you know, that what we're working on uh, will never give us an opportunity to work in the space field. And I have to admit, when I rec I recognize, when I got our young graduate ship in ESA, was, um, uh, that really got my confidence up thinking, okay, I mean, because I was, in microelectronics thinking okay i'm gonna be working on microelectronics maybe for for I don't know, for computers or something and suddenly you start to see its use in space and this gives you a bit closer to thinking okay well this is an area which i hadn't thought of but i honestly my 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 fascination for for satellites for building came from doing a course in fact when i was in isa your graduate i did a spacecraft system engineering course a spacecraft system engineering course which tells you and explains to you how satellites work. Um, the different parts I've mentioned, whether it's the power, the thermal, the attitude, the control, I mean, the the the, uh, the, uh, the navigation, um, all of these, and communication, of these five are the key to how a satellite works. And you just learn about those, but you also learn about how the how rockets get you into space, and you learn all about the orbits. And when you learn all of this thing, suddenly it, space is not just, uh, it's not just something like where you see a rocket going up and you hear about a satellite being launched, suddenly it puts it in, in practical terms for you. You're suddenly understanding what are the different areas in space that you can actually work on. So if I was to suggest to anybody who was gonna, who you're unsure if, if, if that you have the background to do sp for a space career or something, but you're really interested in it, then I would suggest you look into do a spacecraft system engineering course. There's there's quite a few around. I mean, I'd say it's, it's worth looking into. Um, uh, it's, it's often called spacecraft system engineering course or space system engineering course, depending. They're all the same, very similar, but uh, yeah. even the study of, of one or two days, just to get the background to understand uh, these areas I'm mentioning, but a bit more detail uh, allows you to then get a better grip of where your expertise might fit in. And from there, then you might decide that, uh, that you uh, want to follow a certain area, but then you can at least look at a certain course that brings you towards that direction. In the area of mechanical engineering, there's there's one where you do um, uh, finite element analysis, which is uh, which uh, with with ter thermal checking the, the the temperatures of things. This is very important for for spacecraft structures, but uh, you can focus in that area. And what's more, ESA is not the be all and end all of of any space career. There's a huge amount of companies in Europe that uh, work in the space field. That's the purpose of ESA. That's the purpose of, of Ireland's participation in ESA. Ireland puts in the money, but it's not like when people say, oh, this satellite costs one billion to call the, the build. And that's what these things cost. It can cost a 500 million or something, you know, even the, the, the satellite I'm working on. But this 500 million, it's not like you get a box and you fill it full of money. It's what it is, is it's, it's, a, it's really a huge amount of contracts. So, ESA, so Ireland puts in uh, whatever it is, 20 million or something and gets back should get back the same money it puts in as contracts and this is what it's getting mm -hmm. it's getting it's putting in this money and companies in ireland are working on space contracts with isa so you can look at country companies in ireland and work in a space field from ireland you can look at uh, in, gotcha. in 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 all around europe there's a lot of companies which do projects for isa so working for isa is not the only way to get into space you can work for any of these companies and still be fully connected to to have this feeling as i've had that you've touched something which has actually, which is now floating in, uh, in, in which is now stuck in, in a satellite floating in space. It's an amazing feeling. 
and you don't have to go to ESA to do that. You can work for any any company uh, working in space field and you still get that feeling. That's brilliant advice, Norris. Thank you. That's really good. And I think you've touched it and it's coming through a lot of what you love about what you do. Is there anything that you dislike about what you do? I think, you know, there's a, it's, but every job has its ups and downs. There's, you cannot uh, say that there's a, I think it's, it can be very stressful sometimes, but so does, so is every job. Um, but I, and I, but I can say it's also very rewarding. Sometimes you get some rewards out of this, which is very, I, again, I cannot compare to any other career, whether the rewards is the same, but you do, you, but it, there are, there are stressful moments for sure, which are very difficult. Um, and you have to remember one thing. And I think, uh, you know, how do you map, let's say the, the, the life work balance, for example, well, uh, you have to remember a satellite never sleeps. Okay, so the lights are there, you know, and, and they don't they don't go off them by themselves unless you put it into hibernation like we did for Zeta for a number of years. But still, yeah. you know, you're still worried about it. But satellites don't sleep. They're flying around the, around the, uh, uh, the Earth uh, continuously or they're going towards space. And so when you, especially after you launch a, a satellite, uh, the first three months are uh, require a lot of work. And often um, you can spend a lot of time. Uh, you know, where you get less sleep than you wanted. It's a bit like having a baby in some ways, you know, <laughs> a, lot of, a number of years, a number of months at least, and even longer. Without, uh, yeah. But it can be, life work balance goes out the window then. When you launch a satellite, life work balance goes out the window because you're focused on on, on, on getting this, uh, you know, teaching the satellite to, to be autonomous. And, uh, and, and leading up to launch as well, there can be a lot of late nights, early mornings. But that's, you know, that's the same whether... You do engineering like what I do, or science like what I do as well. So uh, like when I'm doing when I was doing my doctorate, which I only did this year, uh, or finished last year. Uh, I mean, this was all based upon working at night time because the family, um, you know, you, you you look after the kids and and and, and the, you're at the family, and uh, uh, but then when do you do science? Because you're doing engineering all day and you do science at night, and so it's uh, it's it's work life balance is uh, it's just the way it is. You've got to manage, but um, but it's very important yeah. to know when to take a break. That's very important. Yeah, no, very good. And you just said it there, you, you know, you're both a scientist and an engineer. Can you describe a little bit, you know, how that interrelates? Is that a common kind of joining of two fields in European space? <laughs> I think it's very or, rare. Yeah, it's very rare. I mean, there's a lot of uh, a lot of scientists in, in ESA who have to do engineering. So there's, it's just a. Uh, uh, you know, it's part and parcel of the work. I mean, they they prefer to be doing science, they prefer to be researching, but they're doing a lot of engineering tasks. And, and some uh, of those scientists would be very annoyed at the fact they're doing engineering because they just prefer science, you know. And 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 from what I perspective, I, from my perspective, I'm an engineer and a scientist, and it's uh, it's quite. And, and I my started off as an engineer, and I've become a scientist over the years. That's just from my interest in comets and asteroids, and and uh, let's even just this ice on the, on the comet I mentioned before. Um, mm. But how do I differentiate between a, a comet, a, a, an engineer and a scientist? And I think that um, the difference between an engineer and a scientist, and here's my quotes at least, you, know, you could always correct, you could always tell me I'm totally wrong. I think a, an engineer likes to put like to put constraints on things. They like to define things, but you, you work within certain constraints, okay? A scientist doesn't like constraints. A scientist likes, needs to have the mind open to actually look at what's possible and to, 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 to not feel that they're constrained by anything because only, only then can you actually can push the boundaries of science and to actually understand things that you, that you believe were, were not possible. So you're, and, and so what is, so for, my, for myself, it's a very strange mix because I'm continuously working with I'm on engineering all the time and then I work with science. And closing the mind and opening the mind is a very strange thing, but I enjoy it very much. It, it gives you a different take on things. But uh, but the reality is when you're doing science, um, uh, what, what scientists don't realize is, uh, uh, and don't tell them this, is that <laughs> at a certain point, there's an engineering process at the very end. Because when it comes to writing a paper, a science paper, you have to constrain because there's otherwise there's no way you can put your results in a paper and publish. So you're forced to constrain it. And it annoys yeah. scientists a lot because they, it, sometimes they're happy because at least they see an end inside because they're forced to, but there's an engineering process involved in whether it's all the, the tabulating and the putting everything in, in a clear way and describing in, in a, a very clear fashion what is the science and how it works. All of this is, is uh, 
for engineering focus but uh, so in some ways Brilliant. there's engineers in it all there's scientists in them all it's just that i'm probably i've gone extreme i'm i'm in continuous conflict i'm a walking contradiction <laughs> brilliant stuff brilliant stuff and can we go back to, to plato as well which, which you're working on now you, you mentioned it at the beginning um a bunch of satellites going up going to look at a, a part of the sky and trying to find exoplanets right i think yeah. that's a, a really uh, bad way of describing it maybe no that's what, perfect perfect what is the like the goal there what do you expect to find can you talk a little bit about uh, how many exoplanets could you envisage um finding out of a project like this yeah i mean it's it's a it's an excellent question i mean the the, the reality is that um uh, people might ask, well, what what differentiates Plato from all these other missions? We're hearing, you know, people say, well, you know, this this is boring. I mean, I'm I'm hearing about an exoplanet. NASA discovered an exoplanet there yesterday. I mean, it it looks the same as the Earth. I mean, why is it that you want to build another satellite? And it's an interesting question. And I'll tell you this, and it's very easy to give the answer. And what you got to ask when you look at when the, all these results, whether it's from NASA or from ESA or well, all all of, all, all these papers or all these publications or news articles which talk about new planet discovered around a star uh, you just have to ask what is the star and is the star the same as our sun because the sun that we have is very different there's you've heard i'm sure of red giants you've heard of brown dwarfs you know you've heard of all of these different things well well our 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 sun is, is known as a yellow dwarf <laughs> it's uh, it's just uh just the way it's a it dwarf believe it is yellow dwarf and it's it's just one type of star and so when you look at uh, a lot of the planets that have been discovered up to now the majority of them have been around brown dwarfs and brown dwarfs are not as hot as our sun and because mm. the brown dwarfs are not as hot as our sun then then the planets are you can you can uh, look at you can see planets uh, closer to them okay i mean let's put it this way they're not totally burned out but there's planets floating close to them but um there's much smaller than our sun and the planets and you can get the what's called the earth-like conditions basically it's like it's called the golden like zone it's where it's not too hot and not too cold you know basically it's if it's too hot we don't have any water on the planet if it's too cold everything frozen you know and that's and so we have this mix this is why we, the situation where you have liquid water that's where life comes from effectively is this liquid water and so what they're looking for is finding trying to find planets that might have the capability of this temperature which would lead to liquid water on the surface and so you look for brown dwarfs and you find ah because it's not as hot as our sun then the planets can be closer in order to, to hit this temperature and because they're closer then they go around the sun much faster okay so mercury travels much faster around the sun than than, than the the earth and so because they travel much faster around the sun that the, the the sun it's are the star is much smaller they travel much faster then just by looking at this star for about let's say third one month you will see this planet pass in front of us a number of times and so hmm. and so basically with this they don't they don't need to wait too long to get a result and so this is how they discover a lot of the planets where the exoplanets we see now you see them when you go great we've got all these exoplanets discovered and it takes this amount of time etc great now what does that differ what's the difference between that and plato Plato is, I think, the best way to describe it is a mission with patience. Okay, patience in that we have got a, that we're going, we're going to launch in 2026. We look at this huge area of the sky, and we're going to look at stars that are like our sun. Okay, but and this is this is this will get you thinking, Brendan. But it's pretty pretty obvious, I guess. You know, if you have a pla if you want to, if you are looking at the, the stars like our sun, and you're looking at one direction of the sun, how often will the planet Earth pass in front of the sun? in uh let's say you know when you're looking at it how often how many days from one how, point in time what, yeah, one year one point one yeah. year exactly exactly so if you want to try to find a planet like ours like like the earth around a star like our sun you have to look at that area for two years and that's patience mm -hmm. okay because yeah to allow you to to because you can easily look at a star for, for for one month but you want to look at other results here you're looking at a huge area of the sky and we're going to stare at that area of the sky for at least two years and all the stars in that area which look like our sun then in this period you're going to have at least twice you're going to see the uh the um the, the, the star the light of the star will dim and when you discover that then and only then can you say that you discovered a planet in the in 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 a a goldilocks zone of uh, of a star like our sun and then we'll follow up and we'll follow up and we look at these uh, these planets we discovered and we look at the atmospheres and if you can find yeah. that the atmosphere has water at that point and that's what makes this mission so cool at that point we'll have discovered earth too 
the second earth oh. existing and that's really the, the focus of it, plato is to, to help us discover the twin earth's twin is it's uh, really by, exciting by being patient. very cool very cool very cool yeah, very uh, very cool can i ask the, our sun the yellow dwarf like how rare is that compared to a brown dwarf when you say you're going to look at our sun or our light <laughs> stars like yeah, our yeah. sun yeah how common are they I, th I mean, the, the, the yellow dwarf is quite common. I think the brown dwarf is more common. Next uh, question I have, Lawrence. What are you most proud of as you look back on your career? I, I mean, working in, in, in the space field means that you, you end up having a lot of achievements. There's no doubt. You work, I've worked on six different satellite missions. And so in each of these, you, you have certain achievements, whether it's with, with TeamSat, this one that was first launched on, on the Ariane 5 or 2, second Ariane 5 launch, where, where I helped to... to put my hands on the satellite in fact i even wrote my name on the on the side of the satellite before it was launched it's uh, to see this in space is really really cool the envies had one i mean to build the full uh the full ground segment needed to actually work when it was in, in orbit was very I, I enjoyed that a lot the for rosetta yeah rosetta is just uh, so many different things especially with so with uh philly uh, so every mission has uh, has its um I really, I, I really let's say the, the high points um I, I think one of the one of my I'm, one of the things I'm very very happy about is to receive a to have um, uh, to have an asteroid named after me. I thought that was really really nice. I thought it was uh, it was it was uh, it was really nice. To, you know, if you ever want to be remembered in the future, at least there's an O'Rourke asteroid out there, which is forever. <laughs> um, I think. And where was, is the O'Rourke asteroid today? It's uh, it's it's far away. I'm, I'm selling a bit of land on it. If you're interested, you know. <laughs> we'll talk about that after. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's in the asteroid belt. It's, it moves very slowly, and uh, it's 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 never going to hit the Earth. You know that would make me famous for sure. It would, but, um, but no, it's it's never going to happen. Um, I, I think this for me is one of the achievements. Of course, writing writing nature papers uh, and getting uh, being a first author of a nature paper is, is really an achievement. Uh, getting my doctors is an achievement. Um, getting awards from the International Astronomical Association for my uh, work on the Philolander was are all achievements. So I. I I, I guess it's it's you you uh, over through the years you 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 gain these recognition which I think is really really nice and uh, but I, I have to admit so working on every satellite mission gives you a lot of uh, rewards it, it's sometimes a pain but you get a lot of reward out of it as well super super and I have a couple a couple of general questions Lars I'd like to throw at you if you'll humor me because I don't get to, to speak sure. to someone uh, like you too often so um, knowing what we know I suppose about the vastness of the universe if there is a, if there is one universe indeed um how much more can we conceivably achieve in space find out in our in our lifetimes let's say well that's an interesting question i mean i think the question is is uh, how long will our lifetimes last <laughs> <laughs> that's a good question too isn't it yeah because <laughs> at that point we start talking about our age you know and i think <laughs> and i think it's 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 fair to say that uh, um the, the time at which uh, mankind stops exploring is is a time where where we we start going backwards uh, let's say in our evolution it's just uh, just a reality i mean the i think this is really what made space ages to want to go and uh, look what was out there the the fact that every single day we're learning new things uh, about space i mean whether it's uh, whether it's just the more recent ones about the gravitational waves or whether we're we're, we're flying uh, we're going to be flying or we are flying satellites to to other planets or or even beyond it's clear that we're we're always learning something new um the space is well named why because there's a lot of it we've got a lot of space <laughs> up there um, and it's it's huge and it's it's uh, it's endless and uh, I I think we've got a long way to go and I think it's it's a talk I gave I think in Astronomy Ireland which was about um, uh, you know traveling to other planets and how fast you need to get to another planet and I think it was uh, it was uh, it, when you look at speed of light and to even travel. Um, half the speed we, we talk about trying to speed to, to if you want to go to the nearest star which i think i can't remember i think it's a few light years away or it's even the, let's say light years which is a year is the the distance for um well it's the the, the speed the speed of taking the speed of light and the time it takes to travel in one year and uh, this is yeah. a huge distance but to travel at to travel at that speed um which i don't think 
we'll ever we'll ever achieve and i don't just need we only need to travel at half the speed of light for example and then you just get twice the time but that's okay you know it's, if, it's, yeah. if it's one year one light year away and you have traveled half the half the speed of light then you'll get there in two years won't you and that two years is fine you know yeah. <laughs> but but yeah. to be able to to get to the to, to to really want to explore there's two things one is learning more about what's around us and this maybe you can do by putting up satellites and every and and even how the how the earth works with satellites but to really understand the universe and to, it requires us to travel to travel we need to move faster because the uh, i think the um to get into space uh, to just to put a satellite in space, you need to travel at seven kilometers, seven and a half kilometers per second. I think to leave the to leave the gravitation of the Earth to go to the Moon, for example, or even beyond, you need to travel about eleven kilometers per second. The fastest object in, t- in space at this present moment, I think, is about going about forty-five kilometers per second, is uh, is one of the Voyager satellites, which has now left the left the uh, the. Um, yeah. Uh, the, the, well, leaving our solar system effectively is on the edge of the, going into interstellar space. But if you think about this, 45 kilometers per second, and you then look at what is the speed of light, we've got a huge barrier to a huge barrier to jump mm. to go to those speeds. And I think when it comes to the future, I'm not saying it's not achievable. I'm saying that this is the biggest challenge for our generation and the generation beyond is to try to see how we can increase the speed of ourselves in space because only then can you start exploring i think that's that's one of the biggest challenges yeah and of course the million the billion dollar question do you think we will have evidence of and i'll give away my age i'm 40 years old so let's say i live till i'm 80 or or 90 (laughs) give me 90 so give another 50 years do you think it's conceivable that we will find evidence of life off our planet in that period of time how likely do you, i know it's a very difficult question to answer but do you think it's likely i think you know what i think is we will uh, i mentioned plato before i think in the next 10 years we will absolutely and most certainly um identify um find planets like the planet earth around other stars but stars like our sun i think we're going to identify at least and i say a few but at least one one earth mm-hmm. twin okay and, and okay so the, what does that mean is what that means is that at least we know there's a planet like ours existing out there and you can and you can be absolutely sure there's millions of even billions of planets like ours uh, floating and i'm talking about like the planet earth you know but but yeah. you have to recognize that the conditions of life is very i mean the conditions in which life has to form when you if you ever to study it it's quite extreme to for for life to form on these planets so even yeah. still, if you find one, the child, you, when you look at probability of life being formed, it's very, very low. But still, what I think is that you will at least identify planets where life is feasible, life as we know it. Okay. Um, will we ever travel there? Well, as I said, if we, in our lifetime, I don't, I really don't see the barrier, the, the speed of light barrier being broken, or even half the speed of light barrier. I just don't see it, and it's going to take us. We, 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 it'll be money, money. It'll be a few generations before this will happen. But will yeah. we identify the existence of life on other planets? Well, one never knows, and I think uh, the only because the only way we can then identify life on other planets it would be if uh, either extraterrestrials land and say hello. You know, and I haven't seen any yet, but I mean, you know, one never knows. You know, <laughs> miracles happen. Uh, I don't believe in I, I don't believe you know in extraterrestrials. I have to just be honest. I think there's I think there's a lot of phenomena which which uh, which uh, which are unexplained, and I and I have to admit I. I I don't need to. I don't have explained. Are the extraterrestrials? Well, unless one comes like and lands outside my door, I'm, I'm you know, I'm fair enough. But I just don't. Yeah. I think a lot of it is, is natural or natural or strange phenomena, which we just unexplained. But I think yeah. maybe when we land on Mars, for example, and I do think that's going to happen in the next uh, 10, 10, 15 years for sure. With Elon Musk and this uh, SpaceX idea, I think for mm-hmm. sure we're going to land on Mars. Uh, and then maybe by walking around them, by, by actually drilling underneath, they might actually find somewhere uh, hidden underneath the surface uh, some microbial sort of things existing uh, you know that are still there present from the time when the water was on the surface who knows that might be an option so i'm just trying to address your question which is that unless something specifically comes down and says hello i don't i think that the only we're going to get it is we'll get evidence maybe of something on mars if we ever touch it or or even we're going to fly to europa for example i think europa which is one of the uh uh, there's a moon of of jupiter i think which is uh releasing uh, water ice so maybe that's going to have an ocean under the, underneath the surface if we can probe that and see what's there 
Yeah. Uh, so I think we might find maybe there's something. Maybe maybe we find something. Yeah. Otherwise, we just and, find possibilities of of planets. Yeah, and and there's there's a lot of talk um, currently as well around this interstellar object that came in past us called Oumuamua, and yeah. there was a lot of talk. I think from some kind of uh, I think there was a Harvard professor that brought out a book saying you know it could have been. You know, it was difficult to analyze that. But is is that part of, I suppose, something as well that there will be more of is monitoring these interstellar objects? And, and is it possible to do something like a Rosetta with those things that come in and try to rendezvous? Or is that a much more difficult, again, task of trying to predict and it's, monitor It's an excellent these question. Things? And the answer is yes. In fact, ESA has a, has a, has a project already approved for it. And what we're going to do is, uh, it's because Oumuamua is it's a very famous interstellar object, um, but to to actually get there means that you need to have a satellite in space ready and waiting. Effectively, you can't just go, oh, it's coming, and then you got three months to build a satellite and launch it, a bit like uh, whatever Armageddon with Bruce Willis or something. Yeah. But at least <laughs> yeah. in this case, you're you're what what ESA is doing is we're going to launch, but it's still at the end of this decade. We're going to we're building and launching a satellite called the Comet Interceptor. And what we're going to do is we're going to launch the satellite and put it into a location which is about 1.5 million kilometers from the Earth, so in the direction of the sun, beyond this, beyond sorry, in the direction of the moon, but beyond the moon because the moon is much closer. Mm -hmm. And we'll we'll leave it there, and effectively it'll be just we'll keep communicating with it, saying, well, are you, how are you getting on, etc. But um, uh, we just wait, and so then we'll be searching the sky for an interstellar object like. Uh, like one that you mentioned, or in, there's always one or two that's been discovered now on a yearly basis. And the idea is that when we discover one, and if it's in the correct orbit, etc., we're going to take our satellites waiting in space, and we're going to then effectively change direction and try to uh, try to rendezvous with it. And that's okay. actually uh, that's that mission has been approved. It'd be very, very, uh, it'd be very, very cool. I think, I mean, especially if they, the, when they choose the the comet to to visit. But it's planned. Yeah. Uh, it's it's definitely planned. It's it's in the works, and they've even started. Uh, I don't want to say start building it, but they're going to start building it in the coming years. Yeah. Yeah. So lots lots to be excited about in the future, and lots of challenges for so. the I younger so. generation graduates coming in. So I'll end, uh, Lawrence, with, with the last question. Um, is is there anything as you look back through your career that you would do differently or any advice you would give to somebody uh, a young graduate listening in that's following in your footsteps it sounds like i'm old but i still have 15 years to go actually <laughs> <laughs> i apologize if i'm insinuating that that's not, not what at i meant all. at all no what i just said yeah and your long <laughs> industrious career um <laughs> i think you know i'll tell you this I, I think uh, what there's a few things to take note. One is that in school, uh, it's all, or even when you go to university and you choose your career, what you think is your career, you may find it's not the career for you, but don't get alarmed. I think it, it, often it's uh, you you find when you're in university or even when you leave that there, or you look for you you've got to find an area that motivates you. Because when you get motivated by something, when you like something, it's a lot easier to learn it, and you actually are more interested. In it. it is normal. You leave past exams just by no by just because you're interested. It's normal, and and so you should never be alarmed if you find that an area is just not not uh, let as you say rocking your boat. You've got to really uh, just take into account that that uh, there's a lot of careers out there. Uh, I started um, I started not knowing any physics. I came out with a degree in physics. I, I had no, no knowledge of microtronics, came out with my, uh, microtronics masters, but even still, what am I doing now? Am I what, I, I'm, what I'm doing now? I can do it uh, like the microtronics. The answer is no. So mm. even though I got a microtronics masters, I still, I'm, I'm not doing anything with microtronics now. I'm doing something completely different. And so your career can easily diverge uh, and, and go to other areas. And, and the most important thing is that you're happy with what you're doing. Okay, that's the first thing. The second thing is that um, is opportunities arise through life and opportunities are can be something as simple as okay we're looking as for somebody who will be able to do this i mean i know it's a it's not a, a great activity etc but it's and it requires a lot of work but um uh, we're looking for somebody to do this take these opportunities because you never know where to lead you know where where you've got a window then you know that you can look through the window you'll see the door you'll see the, the hidden door there's a lot of ways of of uh 
of uh, moving forward in your in your life and your career and you just don't recognize it because it's often these opportunities which you don't take which is the one thing that you're that did that is just you're missing uh, that that mm. uh, and, and and i certainly suggest take these opportunities because sometimes well, sometimes maybe and don't blame me if you do regret one of them don't blame me <laughs> but by golly you'll find the majority of them will actually will give you something that's of a benefit and that's very important yeah, superb advice. Superb advice. Uh, listen, I could I could talk to you all day long. I've I've really fun, really enjoyed yeah. it, and thank you so much for your time. Um, so, okay. Dr. Lawrence O'Rourke, thank you. Thanks, Take Dr. care. Cheers.